Hey y'all, I'm Reese Palmer, host of Color Me Country Radio on Apple Music Country. And what you're about to see is a roundtable discussion between myself, country superstars Cam and Maren Morris, and author, journalist, and activist Andrea Williams. We're going to be discussing what it truly means to be an ally, as well as what we all think it's going to take to make the country music industry truly diverse and equitable. And so we kick off this discussion with Marin explaining the motivation behind her CMA acceptance speech in November. There are so many amazing black women that pioneered and continue to pioneer this genre. And I know they're gonna come after me, they've come before me, but you've made this genre so, so beautiful. I hope you know that we see you. Thank you for making me so inspired as a singer in this genre. Well, Marin, I want to start with you because we haven't had a chance to talk offline about what you did, but girl, walk us through what the hell you were thinking. No, like, why did you, <laughs> what made you do that? Like, what, where did that come from? I just remember walking up there. It was like my third time to go up there. And I was obviously like so gracious because it's like the bones peaked right when the world shut down and I was like about to go into labor and I, I could not believe that you know my town for a song that was crossover um didn't go with the country as song to to you know give the award to that night and so for the third time I, I you know I won female vocalist I was walking up there and I was like I can't thank my label I can't thank like management right now I, it was just like a really somber moment, even though I was like celebrating and excited. And I just thought like, you know what? I don't even know what the viewership was of the awards that night, but I was like, there are millions of people at home watching right now. Everyone's home right now. Who can you, whose name can you put in this that will drive people to go to their Apple Musics, go to their iTunes, go to their socials and be like, after this whole crazy night, actually go and listen to some new music for a change after a three hour show, you know, awarding the same like white people, the same shit. So <laughs> that was sort of like my thinking. And, you know, I certainly was not trying to be performative at all. I genuinely was thinking about the people that kind of kicked the door in for me and gave my name in a platform like that, some recognition and be like, oh, now people are like going to my socials and discovering me. Um, several people mm -hmm. did that early on in my career. And I, that's kind of where my heart was at. And um, yeah, it was just such a weird night. And I, I felt like I've got to say something. Well, I didn't get a chance. I, I said thank you on social media, but I wanted to say it to you. Thank you. For that and like no it did not feel performative or anything like that and um thank you well like sincerely thank you cam one of the things that i love about you since i have gotten to know you this year is you're one of those people that let me sit down and think about this so i can do this in a meaningful way and you have been instrumental in starting the acm diversity board you're like the national patron saint of diversity boards in Nashville. <laughs> and I love it because like you, you like wherever you go, you like, uh, uh, you can't do that. So where did that come from in you? I was invited to the Grammy diversity and inclusion task force, which happened as, you know, kind of like the PR answer to the PR nightmare of Neil Portnow saying, step up. If women want to be involved, they can step up. And so, you know, this is kind of a normal corporate thing to put together a task force. But they ended up having some people on there who were not about to do run of the mill things like Tina Chen and and me, too. I think I was sitting in that room and looking at these numbers for the Recording Academy, which is supposed to be, you know, our closest thing to like an industry wide protector preservationist group, you know, and the numbers are bad and describing like we have a gender problem, but then also like maybe we don't fully have a race problem because we have certain people in certain genres. And then you start, of course, that ignores 
people who have the burden of race and gender, which is often black women are just getting left out of the conversation completely. We're working on the nominating committees, which is who chooses who's going to be the final Grammy nominees, which is a big deal. Even if you don't win, if you're a Grammy nominee, I know this personally, this is a big deal for opportunities and money and your career and prestige and whatever. And those committees have a lot of sway, right? And if you have a committee that doesn't fully represent all the people and the perspectives, you're going to have whitewashed results, basically. And when we got diversity kind of efforts to repopulate these groups and make sure that we had more people of color, more women on these, you know, nominating review committees, country came back and was still at zero people of color. And <laughs> And that's like, you know, we're saying people of color. We're not even saying black people at this point. So I just right. was like, I mean, you know, um, hey, <laughs> that zero, that zero is not cool. You know, we can do that. And like a head person working there that still works there told me, just tried to explain how that was fine and normal. Like, how could you expect <laughs> more from country music, which is an, a normal thing or not a normal thing. This is a thing I hear a lot about how this is white people music. And so how could you expect more from this? I remember talking about this once everyone started posting their black squares <laughs> to the, you know, girl to do the squares. thing. And I was like, you know, this, this is where we're coming from. This is the work we have to do. And then I got called by someone who supposedly cares very much about diversity white woman to tell me that bringing up these kinds of stories only hurts progress. And that is a mm. thing that is really, I just, I know that this group knows this and I just, anyone listening, like we can't play this game anymore of pretending everything's fine. Even mm -hmm. if you're trying, like you have to be okay being uncomfortable I'm uncomfortable. Marion's uncomfortable. I know Reese and Andre have to be uncomfortable every single day. That's the little of it. Like, we are not going to get anywhere pretending that everything's fine. And I just, I'm, I'll get off my soapbox. That's a no. long answer to your thing. <laughs> Linda Martell is the highest charting black woman ever on the country charts. She's higher than me. She's higher than Mickey. She's higher than the Pointer Sisters. She's higher than everybody. I want to talk to Andrea because Andrea, so I met Andrea doing an article when she reached out to me about doing an article for Zora magazine at the beginning of the year about Linda and about the 50th anniversary of Color Me Country. And um, it was at the same time that I was contemplating making this show. And one of my favorite finds of 2020 is Andrea because Andrea gives me life. She is Shaka Khan. Everyone. <laughs> she and Shaka Khan. When I grow up, I would like to be a, oh, a morph of them. I have never, um, hold on, <laughs> never, ever been in the same category with Shaka Khan. I have arrived. Thank Baby. you very much. We're Baby. done. <laughs> yes. So you are, I'm trying to think of the right word because I don't want to say relentless because relentless is like somebody like a dog with a bone, but like you are undeterred in your pursuit of honesty and of equity in country music especially and so number one where does that come from for you and why I mean aside from the fact that you're a black woman in the United States like so we're already starting at like negative 10 but like then <laughs> what on top of that pushes you to to push the way you do and to move the way that you do yeah um I I've shared this before and I like I know I've told you I've talked to Cam about it. I'm like I feel like I have to keep reminding people of like my personal story and like why I'm here um but yeah like we my husband and I and like we had two kids at the time we moved to Nashville like about a decade ago and I'd met him like he I was at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum at the time working in marketing working in marketing and development 
and he was fronting a jazz band and we'd like hire them for like, you know, special events and things like that. But he was, you know, he also had a production company and was like always doing all the things and, you know, wanted to be in a place where it was like people didn't look at you strange if you're like, yeah, I'm a musician full time or, you know, I produce records for a living. And so I was like, yeah, I'll follow you anywhere except for. New York or LA. So, <laughs> so no, like we came to Nashville and it was like, it was cool. He was super excited about it because, you know, in country music, there is still that emphasis on live instrumentation and there still is the ability to like, like, you know, I, I talk about Marin all the time and like, you can hear all the influences in the music that like, she grew up listening to all these different things and you can like put that in there. So he was like super excited about that and like came here and hit the wall quickly. So like, you know, Reese, you saying like, you know, everybody's like, yeah, you know, you're great. I'm gonna call you like, or you call me or whatever. And then it's crickets. Like that was literally like the story being married to him like raising a family with him and seeing how that directly impacts all the things like finances, like, you know, being like having to like talk him, you know, talk him up because, you know, here's another day where you've hit the wall. And what does that do? I mean, it's hard enough being a creative anyway. Like we're taught that like, you know, you have to develop the thick, thick, the thick skin and deal with the rejection and all of that. But then to add the layer on top of it of like, do you even have a chance as a black man, like realistically? Um, and it changes the game. Reese, we've talked about this, like you decided to launch this Color Me Country Fund because you know what it's like to be down to your last dollar. And so there is a def a different level of urgency that sticks with you. I have a level of urgency because I am married to a guy who has been told he can't work in this industry because of what he looks like. And like, it's never like, I mean, literally like, the way it crushes you to hear mm. you're so incredible. Why aren't you working here? I'm not going to hire you either, but Oh my gosh, you should be doing all the <laughs> right. things like legit, like legit, right. Like, all the time. And I mean, and cam can like, I feel like I always like have to preface like, no, he's really good. But like cam can like attest to this. Cause like she's hired him and it's like, yeah, it, it, it changes everything. And it gives you a different perspective. Like this is not numbers on the board. Like, the zeros that Cam talks about, it absolutely means something. But when you have that personal connection, this is why like as a journalist, when I'm telling stories, I present a person like there is a real personal anecdote for you to really get behind this and understand what this like. Like I live with this for a decade. So, no, it's not a game to me like. I know my husband, he, you know, knows so many people that have had the same experiences. Like we're literally talking about people who cannot eat in this town, in this $10 billion industry because of what they look like. I mean, shoot, I'm going to go back to, to the example of Linda. Like, yes. I'm not going to speak on her personally because that's not my place, but I am going to say right. that all the spins that Color Me Country gets as a result of everything that has happened in the past year, she benefits from none of it. Yeah. And so... um I don't ever, she was a, a huge reason why we started the fund for exactly what Andrea just said, because it doesn't make any damn sense that she wasn't able to live for the rest of her life financially set and, and able to make other albums. And there's nothing else to explain it other than racism. Like there's, there's nothing else. So I want to, um, this is another thing that Cam said that I thought was fantastic. I think, and Marin, you touched on this as well, that a lot of people think that this is not their problem. I mean, conceptually, if this is, I feel like you have to understand that it's bigger than just looking at your dollars and cents and who's on the chart right now. I think you have to see history and you have to understand white supremacy and the power structure that is set up to put us into a hierarchical system. And just because you're above somebody else doesn't mean somehow you're outside of this ladder that was created. You're still in it. And the, you know, like the tokenization of a few people or like an interesting minority group, like white women that are allowed in a certain way, like 
the power is has not been shifted in a way that's like actually getting people in the room for the correct representation to shift things. So like not to take it, let me bring it back to the <laughs> the space, but like country music has been continually defined as white men's music. And it has been done so, it has been done in that image so well that now we have to spend time explaining like you had to do why you even are in country music, Reese, like why, Mm -hmm. why you as a black woman could even have heard of country music. Like that's how correctly (laughs) they've erased everything. And that story isn't just a, I guess I'm trying to find a way to say this well, and I'm sure everybody else is going to do it better, but The story isn't just black women don't get a shot and everybody else does. There's varying degrees of we're not going to let you in. We're told that our own fight is getting more women in country music on the radio. And that's our fight. And that's what we like zone in on. And all the while... Black women artists, especially in country music, are completely left out of that conversation. People don't like uh, being told that there's a problem. People don't like being told that they have to work to fix it. People don't like being told that they themselves are the perpetrator of the problem. I am perpetrating perpetrating the problem. Marin is perpetrating the problem. Like all of us in our own way are adding to this mix. Those people who think they are there who are offended because I'm saying, actually, no, you're not. Like, you know, the white women, there's there's a, you know, weekly some kind of back and forth with some white woman who, because she has stood up for white women in the past and is now this, like, in her mind, some kind of, like, raised fist, like, activist is like, how dare you tell me that I am not doing all the things when clearly you have been here fighting only for white women? You know, like, Reese brought up Tomato Gate. That was, like, in 2015. We're having this conversation in 2020 because Tomato Gate was never about black women. It was always about white women. How do we get a larger piece of the pie for women who are already in the door? We're not even talking about getting the rest of those in. We're not talking about the fact that, yeah, like when you, I mean, and this is, this is white feminism overall. It's not just a, applicable to country music, but black men don't have a shot either. If you look at those numbers and like, you know, Jada can can show like the stats, the numbers, it's like white men, white women, way down black men. <laughs> right. And then yeah, black, black women are under black men, but black men are way down there. So when you do this like women, women, women thing, you're still not considering other men who have the same issues because it really is a race issue to talk to, you know, Cam's point about this ladder like there's a whole lot of people that are sitting under white women and if you're if your idea of fixing this industry of raising people up is starting there and not reaching from the bottom you're gonna get it wrong and we won't fix it and you're still gonna be hurt in the long run right this is an issue in politics in general when are we gonna get to a point where we're where we're no longer taking the cheap shots grabbing the low hanging fruit about the people that are way on the other side who Mm. we hate all the time and when are we gonna (laughs) look at the people around us and say That's not good enough. You're not there yet. We cannot make actual progress. It is too easy for me to sit. And I see like even like since what happened at the Capitol, so many people in this Nashville space that are doing all of this stuff that are calling out the the Confederate flags that were traipsed through the Capitol building that have been to billions of shows with Confederate flags that don't care that black people can work in this town. Mm -hmm. That like all the things that nobody wants to say anything about, but you can sit and feel comfortable about saying oh my gosh look at these crazy white right wingers and look at how they're tearing apart our gut that's easy that's easy that doesn't push anybody forward and something else that you said that I just want to point back to because you basically answered what Reese was asking earlier why can't it like why do we have to involve everybody because historically we as white women we tried it putting just us first suffrage yeah. like we played this game and did it work out for everybody like no. are we top dog right now and everybody else is below us like no we're still second fiddle so 
if you're really looking at the end game, not that it should have to be in your own best interest, but human beings, like you didn't, we didn't win that way. Yeah. Like it's not going to, if you got to get everybody on your team, because turns out we actually are on the other side of the table from those guys who have the power yeah. and we're all in this same boat to varying degrees. On that note, I want to say, first of all, y'all, y'all. We could do like three more hours. It's so good. <laughs> I know everybody's got babies and they got stuff they got to do. So I want to, I want to, I want to bring, I want to end on this note. Um, one of my favorite quotes is a James Baldwin quote. And it's like, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for that reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. I love country music. I have always loved country music. It is a part of my growing up. It is a part of you know, the fabric who, of who I am as an artist. And because of that, I feel very content and very comfortable having these discussions about it because I love it so much. So I want to end on, and I know y'all love it because you've dedicated your lives to it. So I want to know from each of you, how do we move forward? I think we all have a space where we have influence, right? For me as a writer, for me as a journalist and telling these stories, like I know the work that I can do, like in my sphere of influence, like Reese, the stuff that you're doing with your show is incredible. And like, I've told you this repeatedly, um, Cam, like, yes, okay, I need to put a show together. And like, some of my people are in LA and like, how are we going to do the thing? Like, I should probably hire black people like to do my, like these things, like in your sphere, there's something that everybody can be doing right now. And I think if we think along the lines of like Cam said, get to the bottom of this, this thing, who is hurting the most and how can we help people that fit into that category? I think we all move forward. All right. Well, it um cam <laughs> what th i don't know what's left after andrea said that but i'm just gonna expand <laughs> really because i think for me personally yeah hiring people into my space that aren't just a bunch of white people making sure when i get offered gigs like if it's an all white lineup ask them did you realize this is an all white lineup here are some black artists you could call. And now I'm realizing people will have excuses for why maybe they still couldn't figure it out with scheduling or money or whatever. And so we're going to have to keep finding new ways to push on that. I think a lot of times artists don't realize how much power they have that we have. And especially like collectively, because we are mm -hmm. the people creating something that gives everybody else a paycheck. Every single person that's making money off of this is because we sat in a room and made something from nothing. And all those people are acting like they made it and they like this power dynamic. That's why they don't want people to share contract negotiation tactics. They don't want people to know what other people had in their contracts. They want to own everything. And there are good people on the label side, by the way. I'm, I know everyone. We all have to say not everybody, just so you're so you know. But it works this way on purpose. And so the more we share with each other, the more we realize that collectively we actually have a massive impact if we make the call. People that are trying to work for your benefit on the inside of these organizations, they're in the power structure too. So if they go to call their boss, how often is their boss going to listen to them? But if an artist picks up the phone, if Merritt picks up the phone and says something, they're like, oh, we better listen because an artist called. But I think the where I can create my space is writing with black songwriters, black artists, and building those relationships like I have with my white co-writers over the years. That happens over time, but it's also, that is where the value lies of the music industry. Those songs don't just create themselves, people do it. So I think that's a huge place to start for me. I think I think that's awesome. It is imperative that we include and, and look around in our circle, like you said, and make sure that we've got some of everything just to make sure that, not because I just picked you because you're black or I just picked you because you're trans or I just picked you because you're gay or whatever, like, or you're disabled, you know, or you're differently abled or whatever. Like I'm choosing you because you are qualified, you deserve to be here and 
You just happen to be all those other things. And it is possible doing this show. I have learned what I already knew, but it was reinforced that we are here. We are capable. We are worthy. And I said this in another publication, but I'm just like, if I can do this from Durham, North Carolina in my basement, then everybody that has a million dollar, billion dollar company in Nashville, in Los Angeles, in New York can do it 10 times, a million times faster than me. And so the way forward for me is to continue to advocate for others and to make sure that in financial backing and in platform, people have a place to come to make sure that they can keep going. And that's what we got to do. So ladies, as I said, we went way over time, but like, thank you so much for your time today. Like seriously, thank you, thank you for your, um, your candor and thank you for your fearlessness and having the conversation and not being afraid to say, to say things and, 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 and to be, to be here. So Andrea, thank you so much. Cam, thank you so much. Marin, thank you so much. I wish that we could have done this in person because I had a real cute outfit that I was going to wear, but <laughs> <laughs> shoes and everything, but it's all right. We're going to do this another time in person and I have flowers for each and every one of you because y'all are all dope. So thank you very much. Thank you for creating thank a you. space that we could do this in. It's amazing.